So we went through a little overview of Savitri, the way it is structured and the themes, principal themes in it. And Sri Aurobindo actually brings a lot into this book apart from the themes because while discussing things he will talk about the condition uh, of the cosmos, the human condition, he will talk about uh, various aspects of yoga, <clears throat> various experiences and he looks at the metaphysical system in a variety of ways also, different ways. So, <clears throat> we touched on the fact that uh, one way in which he sees this entire scheme is that of the gendered reality of Purusha and Prakriti. That there is one being that becomes two as the condition for a manifestation. That it's almost like two infinities that mirror each other and one is a executive power and the other is the potential consciousness. So, this condition which can create a cosmos through its relationship can either be one in which the two know themselves to be one and it is really a two in one that is manifesting or one in which the two are sundered from each other, broken, divided and it is a kind of disguise in which they are relating as if they do not know each other. And this becomes the condition for an evolution to occur. So, it is these are the two realms that I spoke about earlier as the heliocentric and the geocentric realms. One in which in, in both of them there can be a creation. It is not that one is without a creation uh, and the other is this creation, but the creation that can occur in a heliocentric zone, the duality is self recognized by both as one. And on the other hand you have the geocentric zone in which the duality is separated, it is they, they do not recognize each other to be one that a divided uh, duality. Um, so, somebody's phone is going on, yes, can uh, you turn it off? Okay. So, I do not know how to mute. I understand. Uh, know how to mute it. Yeah, if somebody can help him. I apologize. So, we have this, these two conditions. And it is interesting that uh, this is one of the central uh, you know metaphysical schema of all Indian philosophy. And this is what creates the two zones called Vidya and Avidya or knowledge and ignorance. Uh, it is not many of the Indian philosophies that tries to see the relationship between the two. Uh, and tries to bridge them through a kind of evolutionary scheme. But one of the philosophies that does see a relationship between the two is Kashmir Shaivism. Because according to that you have a kind of a series by which the one and the two relate. So, there are three zones in Kashmir Shaivism as well. The Vidya zone is called the Para, uh, zone of the Para, the supreme and what I was called, so that is the heliocentric and what I was calling the geocentric is the Apara or the transient, non-transcendental whatever you want to call it. And there is a intermediate zone called Parapara which means knowledge dash ignorance or or uh, you know absolute dash relative. See? And the way in which the, the, the kind of descent of consciousness takes place is that at the heights of the para zone there is the one para shiva 
and then Parashiva undergoes certain transmutations which are really differences in relation between him and his double. So, it is as if there is a two infinities that come out of the one infinity that is Shiva and Shakti and, and the first zone that is the zone coming down from Parashiva the next one uh, they would be in a kind of a state of uh, mutual identity. In other words, you could not know which one is Shiva and which one is Shakti. They could choose to be either. And then the third zone, you have a reality in which the two are mutable. In, in other words, they have separated into the two, but they can merge back into the one or take alternative identities. And then the fourth zone is where they start separating into two knowing that they are the one and the two. And it is only in the fifth zone that they completely separate into the two and become the basis of a manifestation in which the two are in play as separate entities. So, this fifth relationship is the basis of the second zone or what we can call the para-para para zone. That becomes the basis and in that zone by itself the two know themselves to be one, but the Shakti which is called Kriya Shakti at that point, the Shakti of execution actually creates Maya and six ontological conditions actually five. Maya is the sixth and these five are going to become the conditions of our cosmos and the upper our reality emerges. So, we can see that there is a certain kind of relationship in this scheme and one can rise up that particular scheme through understanding the relations till one gets to the para and know the two to be one. Sri Aurobindo is using a similar kind of uh, set of relations, but in his system that this duality that emerges in the what we might, we might call the Apara zone is an evolutionary duality in which the two exist as separate realities, so that they may unite in the soul of the creature and know themselves to be one and one can have the creation of the para in the opera. You see. So, I would like to before we go into the uh, actual uh, schema of Ashwapati and Savitri and their yogas, <coughs> I wanted to start off by reading uh, one way in which he feels this in the canto called uh, the secret knowledge which is Canto 4 in uh, book 2, Ashwapati's journey. And this Canto is interestingly poised between two uh, Cantos that talk about Ashwapati's yoga, uh, the yoga of the king. And one of them he realizes his own freedom, he uh, encounters uh, higher consciousness and he is having these experiences which show to him the meaning of uh, the cosmos. And then Sri Aurobindo enters into this canto called the secret knowledge, uh, the first part of which is very beautiful, but towards the end he starts describing what is the secret knowledge which is the relationship between Ishwara and Shakti which becomes Purusha and Prakriti in the Apara realm of the cosmos. So, I would like to start by reading passages from that uh, before going uh, deeper into uh, Satyavan Savitri. All here where each thing seems its lonely self are figures of the soul transcendent one. An unseen presence moulds the oblivious clay. A playmate in the mighty mother's game, 
one came upon the dubious whirling globe to hide from her pursuit in for force and form. A secret spirit in the inconscient sleep, a shapeless energy, a voiceless word. He was here before the elements could emerge, before there was light of mind or life could breathe. Uh, by the way, this is page 60 in my version, Book 1, Canto 4. Accomplice of her huge, accomplice of her cosmic huge pretense, his semblances he turns to real shapes and makes the symbol equal with the truth. He gives to his timeless thoughts a form in time. He is the substance, he the self of things. She has forged from him her works of skill and might. She wraps him in the magic of her moods and makes his myriad truths her countless dreams. So we have substance and force. The master of being has come close to her, an immortal child born in the fugitive years, in objects wrought in the persons she conceives, dreaming she chases her idea of him and catches here a look and there a jest. Ever he repeats in them his ceaseless births. He is the maker and the world he made. He is the vision and he is the seer. He is himself the actor and the act. He is himself the knower and the known. He is himself the dreamer and the dream. There are two who are one and play in many worlds. In knowledge and ignorance they have spoken and met, and light and darkness are their eyes interchange. Our pleasure and pain are their wrestle and embrace. Our deeds, our hopes are intimate to their tale. They are married secretly in our thought and life. The universe is an endless masquerade, for nothing here is utterly what it seems it is a dream fact vision of a truth, which but for the dream would be not wholly true. A part is seen, we take it for the whole. They have made the, they ha, thus have they made their play with us for roles. Author and actor with himself for see, as seen, he moves there as the soul, as nature, she. This is the knot that ties together the stars. The two who are one are the secret of all power. The two who are one are the might and right in things. His soul, silent, supports the world and her. His acts are her commandments, registers. Happy, inert he lies beneath her feet. His breast he offers for her cosmic dance, of which our lives are the quivering theatre and none could bear but for his strength within, yet none could leave because of his delight. The master of existence lurks in us and plays at hide and seek with his own force. In nature's instrument loiters secret God. The absolute, the perfect, the alone has coiled out has called out of the silence his mute force, where she lay in the featureless and formless hush, guarding from time by her, uh, guarding from time by her immobile sleep, the ineffable puissance of his solitude. The absolute, the perfect, the alone, has entered with his silence into space. He has fashioned these countless persons of oneself. He lives in all who lived in his vast alone. Space is himself and time is only he, the absolute, the perfect, the immune, one who is in us as our secret self, our mask of imperfection has assumed. He has made this tenement of flesh his own, his image in the human measure cast, that to his divine measure we might rise. Then in a figure of divinity, the maker shall recast us and impose a plan of Godhead on the mortal's mold, lifting our finite minds to his infinite, 
touching the moment with eternity. This transfiguration is earth's due to heaven. A mutual debt binds man to the supreme. His nature we must put on as he put ours. We are sons of God and must be even as he. His human portion we must grow divine. Our life is a paradox with God for key. There is a plan in the mother's deep world whim, a purpose in her vast and random game. This ever she meant since the first dawn of life, this constant will she covered with her sport to evoke a person in the impersonal void. With the truth light strike earth's massive roots of trance, wake a dumb self in the inconscient depths and raise a lost power from its python sleep that the eyes of the timeless might look out from time and the world manifest the unveiled divine. For this he left his white infinity and laid on the spirit the burden of the flesh that Godhead seed might flower in mindless space. So this is the, the poetic rendering uh, by Sri Aurobindo of this play between Purusha and Prakriti, between Ishwara and Shakti, that occurs in a certain form here, but is moving towards its recognition as the one, the two in one. See? And that is the secret that Ashwapati recognizes. And having recognized that, he Re lives it in his own life and then he seeks it for the world. How can the world receive this truth and you know follow its uh, movements? <coughs> so in the canto before this we see uh, Ashwapati, we are introduced to Ashwapati. And uh, I read a little bit, you can see uh, who Ashwapati is in Canto 3. This is page 22. A world's desire compelled her mortal birth. So we are going back as we, as we saw that the, the epic begins in the middle. And we are first introduced to the dawn on which Satyavan will die. And then we are introduced to Savitri, who is experiencing this dawn. And as I said, this is a dawn at different levels. Uh, in a way, it is the dawn of Savitri's awakening into her full avatarhood. And it's also the dawn of a new cosmic age. And so uh, from that, Sri Aurobindo segues through a kind of a flashback to Ashwapati. How did Savitri, who is this person Savitri? And she is foregrounded by uh, another avatar, the avatar of aspiration. She is the avatar of grace, who has been called down by the avatar of aspiration. A world's desire compelled her mortal birth. One in the front of the immemorial quest, protagonist of the mysterious play, in which the unknown pursues himself through forms and limits his eternity by the hours and the blind void struggles to live and see, a thinker and toiler in the ideal's air brought down to earth's dumb need her radiant power. So you're introduced to her Ashwati right in the beginning as somebody who will call this intervention. That is his purpose. And that is really what links him to the whole epic. His was a spirit that stooped from larger spheres into our province of ephemeral sight, a colonist from immortality. So right in the beginning, we are shown that this is a Ishwara Koti. This is a person who travels the ladder 
up and down you see so uh, he is like a rishi he is a colonist from immortality an avatar a pointing beam on earth's uncertain roads his birth held up a symbol and a sign so this is the idea of the symbol that is continuing and his life also is a multi-layered life he lives for himself but he also lives for the world he his physical reality is a symbol of the aspiration of the world his human self like a translucent cloak covered the all wise who leads the unseeing world affiliated to cosmic space and time and paying here god's debt to earth and man a greater sonship was his divine right so it's a funny little hint that sri aurobindo will throw in from other forms and other theologies so we find here a little hint of christ you see the idea of the debt which is all christian theology the, the debt because the sacrifice of god uh, is what is being lived out this is the vedic idea of the sacrifice as well but it is not humanity that will be able to actually absolve that sacrifice it needs god's incarnation to absolve that sacrifice so god pays the debt of man uh, in that sense and that's what he's pointing out that he has come to pay the debt of god to man paying here god's debt to earth and man a greater sonship was his divine right so this is exactly another you know sort of description of the christ and i i'm going to jump from here in a little bit to sri aurobindo's descriptions of christ because as i was saying i see christ as a kind of a shadow figure for the soul of man that is actually embodied here as satyavan so this is another alter ego that is coming out of another tradition that in this case uh, is being foregrounded because it is another possibility uh, that hides the mechanics you see the mechanics that he brings forth in uh, savitri of the intervention of the shakti is lived in the life of the ishvara avatar so and, and as i pointed out the, the the a very important revision of the notion of the avatar by sri aurobindo is that the avatar suffers and that is something that the indian tradition does not field in its description of the avatar and so he needs that to complete that description christ is necessary from that point of view although consenting to mortal ignorance his knowledge shared the light ineffable a strength of the original permanence entangled in the moment and its flow he kept the vision of the vasts behind a power was in him from the unknowable an archivist of the symbols of the beyond a treasurer of superhuman dreams he bore the stamp of mighty memories and shed their grandiose ray on human life so here he is he's like a palimpsest he's got many lives that are just as we were discussing about krishna who said that i remember all my lives so this is a person who is bringing the entire history the time dimension is alive in him you know what is the meaning of history as evolution his days were a long growth to the supreme a skyward being nourishing its roots of sustenance from occult spiritual founts climbed through white rays to meet as an unseen sun his soul lived as eternity's delegate his mind was like a fire assailing heaven his will a hunter in the trails of light an ocean impulse lifted every breath each action left the footprint of a god each moment was a beat of puissant wings this little plot of our mortality touched by this tenant from the heights became a playground of the living infinite
So as his yoga grows, the spiritual power that's in him starts manifesting. There's a place where Sri Aurobindo has said, a difference between a soul that is born in the ignorance and an avatar is that the soul born in the ignorance evolves towards its divinity, while the avatar progressively manifests its divinity. This is a subtle change, subtle difference. That this evolution towards divinity is actually taking place through a darkness and an ignorance which we cannot overcome without the grace. It's, it, it's these jumps that take place. Each one is a jump of the double power of aspiration and grace. While the avatar is, in a sense, the grace power that is manifesting more and more of itself as it encounters the darkness. It's just behind, it just has to call on it and it comes in front. See? So this is how Ashwapati is being described. And at the same time, by himself, he cannot effect this world change. He needs the Shakti avatar. But he has to go through his yoga. He has to do yoga and arrive at the full realization of who he is. And that's how he, this particular canto ends. Apart he lived in his mind solitude, a demigod shaping the lives of men. One soul's ambition lifted up the race. So this is the thing about the avatar in the sense that we find it even in the life of the Buddha. They embody the aspiration of the world. Somewhere they carry the burden of the aspiration of, of, the, of the world. Uh, whereas others are burdened by their individual problems, these beings are burdened by massive cosmic problems. And that's what they've come to solve. And until they can solve it, they can't rest. So, uh, a demigod, uh, apart he lived in his mind solitude, a demigod shaping the lives of men. One soul's ambition lifted up the race. A power worked, but none knew whence it came. The universal strengths were linked with his. Filling earth's smallness with their boundless breaths, he drew the energies that transmute an age. Immeasurable by the common look, he made, a great, he made great dreams a mold for coming things and cast his deeds like bronze to front the years. His walk through time outstripped the human stride, lonely his days and splendid like the sun's. So this this another very interesting little quote that Sri Aurobindo has said. It says that uh, there are beings who just by their presence can change an age. They don't have to do anything. Just by their presence, they can change an age. And uh, he talks about this a little bit in a slightly different, not not in such an exalted sense, but still in a very important uh, context. Uh, about the presence of Leonardo da Vinci in the, in the Renaissance. says he carried the entire Renaissance in himself. And just his presence was like a catalyst that could bring those forces into play and inspire people to manifest them. And that's, what the, that's one of the things that the avatar does. The avatar has that kind of universal energy that is at work that causes this manifestation to take place around him. So we go to the third, uh, the canto after uh, the secret knowledge. Which is canto 5, book 1, canto 5. And uh, Ashwapati becomes aware of this knowledge, this knowledge of the one that has become the two and that have become sundered, the knowledge of the difference between vidya and avidya and the need for the two to emerge into one. So he says, it begins, 
this knowledge first he had of time-born men admitted through a curtain of bright mind that hangs between our thought and absolute sight he found the occult cave the mystic door near to the well of vision in the soul and entered where the wings of glory brood in the sunlit space where all is forever known indifferent to doubt and to belief avid of the naked real's single shock he shored the cord of mind that ties the earth heart and cast away the yoke of matter's law the body's rules bound not the spirit's powers when life had stopped its beats death broke not in he dared to live when breath and thought were still thus could he step into that magic place which few can even glimpse with hurried glance lifted for a moment from mind's labored works and the poverty of nature's earthly sight so another very interesting thing is that uh, if you read sri aurobindo's record of yoga uh, you will find that a lot of the things that he's talking about here are actually being recorded by him experiences that are being recorded by him which should tells us how ashwapati is really a spiritual autobiography of uh, sri aurobindo particularly during that period so, and um, so somebody uh, richard hartz is doing a study of that at at this time mm -hmm. how these things have appeared in savitri <coughs> A will, a hope immense, now seized his heart, and to discern the superhuman's form, he raised his eyes to unseen spiritual heights, aspiring to bring down a greater world. So this is he experiences this in himself, and now he wants to bring it down for others, and he also wants to stabilize it in himself. So this is the whole notion of. the descent you know that that central to these teachings that there is the ascent of the aspiration and the descent of the grace and this entire world can descend by the power of the godhead in that world the glory he had glimpsed must be his home a brighter heavenlier sun must soon illume this dusk room with its dark internal stair the infant soul in its small nursery school mid objects meant for a lesson hardly learnt outgrow its early grammar of intellect and its imitation of earth nature's art its earthly dialect to god language change in living symbol study reality and learn the logic of the infinite the ideal must be nature's common truth the body illumined with the indwelling god the heart and mind feel one with all that is a conscious soul live in a conscious world so he wants this change to inhabit the earth it is not enough that he has moments of trance where he can experience these things he wants this to be the common waking reality that he has and others have so that becomes the burden of his problem you see just like they say buddha had a problem this problem was the problem of suffering once he encountered that problem it was not just his personal problem it was the world problem and he couldn't stop till he solved it this becomes ashwapati's problem he cannot stop until he can see why these worlds that exist which are perfect are not manifest here why can't they be here why can't that be our common experience so he goes into deep inward trance his soul retired from all that he had done hushed and futile hushed was the futile din of human toil forsaken wheel the circle of the days 
In distance sank the crowded tramp of life. The silence was his sole companion left. Impassive he lived, immune from earthly hopes, a figure in the ineffable witness's shrine, pacing the vast cathedral of his thoughts, under its arches dim with infinity and heavenward brooding of invisible rings. A call was on him from intangible heights. Indifferent to the little outpost mind, he dwelt in the wideness of the eternal's reign. His being now exceeded thinkable space. His boundless thought was neighbor to cosmic sight. A universal light was in his eyes. A golden influx flowed through heart and brain. A force came down into his mortal limbs. A current from the eternal seas of bliss. He felt the invasion and the nameless joy. So this is, you know, he, he rises into this cosmic consciousness. So this is a consciousness above the mind from which something universal is entering into him. This process of going up and calling down is proceeding beyond the normal earthly bound. In a divine retreat from mortal thought, in a prodigious gesture of soul sight, his being towered into pathless heights, it goes further, naked of its vesture of humanity, as thus it rose, to meet him bare and pure, a strong descent leaped down. So this is the beginning of the descent. The Shakti that he's invoking comes down. A might, a flame, a beauty half visible with deathless eyes, a violent ecstasy, a sweetness dire, enveloped him with its stupendous limbs and penetrated nerve and heart and brain that thrilled and fainted with the epiphany. This is the beginning, I mean, he, he, this happens a number of times that he is overwhelmed and he passes out, he faints. Uh, in Sri Aurobindo's uh, you know, teaching of the Om, he talks about the four stations of the Om. And the third station, the first one is the waking, uh, Jagrat. The second is the dreaming, Swapna. The third station is called Shushupti, which literally means to sleep in sleep. It's a depth of sleep within sleep. And normally it is thought that this is the realm of the passage from Avidya to Vidya. The passage from Avidya to Vidya. And that's the reason why those who enter it enter into deep trance and don't remember much when they come back. In Sri Aurobindo's case, he is calling us to remain awake in that state. But we cannot in our present condition remain awake in that state. So what he's talking about is what is the preparation necessary to remain awake in that state. That is a very important aspect of what we call integral yoga. Integral yoga is the preparation for the waking consciousness to remain in the Shushupti and ultimately further and further into the Shushupti. So to do that, one has to pass beyond one's capacities. And this is what happens repeatedly, you find that in Ashwapati. He passes beyond his capacities, passes out. He faints. He actually enters a Shushupti. But this makes it possible for him to retain that consciousness later. It becomes the ground of something that he stays awake in later. So this happens over here. His nature shuddered in the unknown grasp. In a moment shorter than death, longer than time, by a power more ruthless than love, happier than heaven, taken sovereignly into eternal arms, hailed and coerced by a stark absolute bliss, in a whirlwind circuit of delight and force, hurried into unimaginable depths, upborne into immeasurable heights, it was torn out from its mortality 
and underwent a new and bornless change. An omniscient knowing without sight or thought, an indecipherable omnipotence, a mystic form that could contain the worlds, yet make one human breast its passionate shrine, drew him out of his seeking loneliness into the magnitudes of God's embrace. So this is the this is the you know the uh, roller coaster of uh, the entry into the uh, vidya planes uh, through the descent. The descent takes place. The intervention occurs and takes him into that state. But he, it's for him. It's his experience, and he won't be satisfied with it. He'll want it for the whole world. So, so this causes him to enter into a kind of systematic study of all these planes. Now he, this, this opens up for him the ability of the Ishwara Koti to ascend and descend the stair of consciousness. That's the result of this. He can now go in a systematic, the whole of the range of consciousness open to his gaze. He can climb as he wants and stay as he wants. So he first experiences it in, its, in, in himself uh, and then he will, the cantos will take us to a systematic study. And so towards the end of this canto, he sees this entire cosmology. A giant order was discovered here of which the tassel and extended fringe are the scant stuff of our material lives. This overt universe whose figures hide the secrets merged in superconscient light wrote clear the letters of its glowing code. A map of subtle signs surpassing thoughts, thought was hung upon a wall of inmost mind, illumining the mind's concrete images into significant symbols by its gloss it offered to the intuitive exegete its reflex of the eternal mystery. Ascending and descending twixt life's poles, the serried kingdoms of the graded law plunged from the everlasting into time. Then glad of a glory of multitudinous mind and rich with life's adventure and delight and packed with the beauty of matter, shapes and hues, climbed back from time into undying self up a golden ladder carrying the soul, tying with diamond threads the spirit's extremes. So this is the golden ladder see, that he encounters. We were talking about Jacob's ladder and the night journey of Muhammad. So this is the ladder that they are talking about, you see, the ladder which he calls the world stair. An organ scale of the eternal acts, eternal's acts, mounting to their climax in an endless calm, paces of the many visaged, wonderful, predestined stadia of the evolving way. Measures of the stature of the growing soul, they interpreted existence to itself, and mediating twixt the heights and deeps united the veiled married opposites and linked creation to the ineffable. A last high world was seen where all worlds meet. In its summit gleam when night is not nor sleep, the light began of the Trinity Supreme. So this last world is the supermind and the Trinity is Satchit Ananda. So he is rising up the ladder and finally he hits this consciousness that is the bridge consciousness, that is the supermind. See? The last high world where all worlds meet. See? In a summit gleam when night is not nor sleep. This is the Shushupti, you see, that is gone out of Swapna, you see. The light began of the Trinity Supreme. All there discovered what it seeks for here. 
it freed the finite into boundlessness and rose into its own eternities. The inconscient found its heart of consciousness. It's, it's Sri Aurobindo's scheme. It is the Sat that has become matter. Matter is nothing but Sat which only exists. Consciousness is latent in it. The inconscient found its heart of consciousness. The idea and feeling groping in ignorance at last, at last clutched passionately the body of truth. The music born in matter silences plucked nude out of the ineffable's fathomlessness the meaning it had held but could not voice. The perfect rhythm now only sometimes dreamed an answer brought to the torn earth's hungry need rending the night that had concealed the unknown, giving to her her lost forgotten soul. So this is the prelude which brings Ashwapati to the seeking for this descent for the whole world. And then he starts exploring the world stair and we enter into the next book which is book two, the book of the traveler of the worlds. Um, any questions, comments at this point? We can take a little pause. Or just a quiet pause. <laughs> like yes, Nick. So, Ashwapati is ascending and then bringing this back, yeah. what he's bringing back is Savitri. Yeah. And Sri Aurobindo is Ashwapati, and here we're reading Savitri. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yes, you could say that Savitri, the text, is the word body of Savitri, the goddess. You know, one may say that Sri Aurobindo and the mother were physical beings that lived in history for a period of time and that experienced certain forms of consciousness that others would desire and had a great fortune in meeting them and that they are no longer here in the physical. But we have to ask the question, is that consciousness limited to the physical? was the physical one form of that consciousness. If that's the case, this is equally a form of that consciousness. So as we saw in, uh, in the cosmology of Sri Aurobindo, he explores these realms. The first starts with the world stair where he sees this uh, he revisits this idea of the ladder that uh, bridges all the worlds or that actually forms the bridge of all the worlds. And then he starts looking at the subtle material world, subtle physical. Because you know, in the Indian scheme of uh, matter, whenever we talk, you know, in the text about matter, it's uh, always described as having two aspects to it. One is called the gross or sthula, and the other is the subtle or sukshma. Matter is always both of these at the same time. Whatever we experience in waking, this is the waking matter, is constituted by the biology that we can study. But simultaneous to that is the dreaming matter, the matter of the subtle worlds, you see. So there is subtle physical. The subtle physical and the gross physical constitute what we call matter. So it's interesting how, you know, in, in modern philosophy, you have people like Bergson, who's making a case for exactly that, saying that all matter 
is also ideal matter. There is both at the same time. There, you cannot talk about having the ideal component residing in material matter as if there are rooms inside our brain in which thoughts and dreams are kept. That is a simultaneous reality of matter. So, the connection between what we normally experience as our material universe and this entire range of the subtle universes is what we call subtle matter. So, entering into subtle matter is the first step of exploring these worlds, the inner being, the first sheath of the inner being is the subtle body. And this exploration that Sri Aurobindo will carry out here is actually an exploration that will take us through the Swapna, the dream worlds, which is the subtle worlds of the ignorance. Swapna ends at the borders of the ignorance with the overmind. See? So, here too we will find that he is going to take us through subtle matter to the vital, the life worlds. And in the life worlds, he will spend quite some time because he will discover how life comes as a divine power. But as we were discussing earlier, when it contacts the matter, it changes its character, it becomes deformed, it can't exist in its glory and freedom. And then we find that within life there exists this kind of perversion that is the world of falsehood see, that we were talking about earlier, uh, ontological evil. See. And that is what keeps us in a way from it is the gravitation of that, the will to falsehood, the will to remain ignorant that keeps us from really experiencing the totality of the higher realms. And that is what makes it necessary to call for the intervention. See? And that is what Ashwapati realizes. And once he realizes that, he starts exploring the higher mind consciousness to find where the mind becomes completely free. This is what he is looking for. So, we find, we read, I read um, first a little bit from the life plane. Okay. So, this is Canto 3, Book 2, The Glory and Fall of Life, page 129. In the crude beginnings of this mortal world, life was not, nor minds play, nor hearts desire. When earth was built in the unconscious void, and nothing was save a material scene, identified with sea and sky and stone, her young gods yearned for the release of souls to sleep in objects, vague, inanimate. <coughs> in that desolate grandeur, in that beauty bare, in the deaf stillness, amid the unheeded sounds, heavy was the uncommunicated load of Godhead in a world that had no needs. For none was there to feel or to receive. This solid mass, which brooked no throb of sense, could not contain their vast creative urge. Immersed no more in matter's harmony, the spirit lost its statuesque repose. In the uncaring trance, it groped for sight, passion for the movements of a conscious heart, famishing for speech and thought and joy and love. In the dumb, insensitive, wheeling day and night, hungered for the beat of yearning and response. The poise in conscience, shaken with a touch, 
the intuitive silence trembling with the name. They cried to life to invade the senseless mold and in brute forms awake divinity. A voice was heard on the mute rolling globe. A murmur moaned in the unlistening void. A being seemed to breathe where once was none. Something pent up in dead, insentient depths, denied conscious existence, lost to joy, turned as if one asleep since stateless time. aware of its own buried reality, remembering its forgotten self and right, it yearned to know, to aspire, to enjoy, to live. Life heard the call and left her native light. overflowing from her bright, magnificent plane on the rigid coil and sprawl of mortal space. Here, too, the gracious, great-winged angel poured her splendor and her swiftness and her bliss, hoping to fill a fair new world with joy. as comes a goddess to a mortal's breast and fills his days with her celestial clasp. She stooped to make her home in transient shapes. In matter's womb she cast the immortal's fire. In the unfeeling vast woke thought and hope, smote with her charm and beauty, flesh and nerve, and force delight on Earth's insensible frame. Alive and clad with trees and herbs and flowers, Earth's great brown body smiled towards the skies. Azure replied to Azure in the sea's laugh. New sentient creatures Fill the unseen depths. Life glory, life's glory and swiftness ran in the beauty of the beasts. Man dared and thought and met with his soul the world. But while the magic, while the magic breath, breath was on its way, before her gifts could reach our prisoned hearts, a dark, ambiguous presence questioned all. The secret will that robes itself with night and offers to spirit the ordeal of the flesh imposed a mystic mask of death and pain. In turn now, in the slow and suffering years, sojourns the winged and wonderful wayfarer and can no more recall her happier state, but must obey the inert in conscience law, insensible foundation of a world in which blind limits are on beauty laid and sorrow and joy as struggling comrades live. A dim and dreadful muteness fell on her. Abolished was her subtle, mighty spirit and slain her boon of child god happiness. And all her glory into littleness turned. And all her sweetness into a maimed desire. To feed death with her works is here life's doom. 
so veiled was her immortality that she seemed inflicting consciousness on unconscious things, an episode in an eternal death. A myth of being that must forever cease. Such was the evil mystery of her change. So we find that the formula of aspiration and grace works at every level. And this is how Sri Aurobindo is showing us that what we normally call evolution is also occurring through a similar process. That there is a consciousness that is hidden and that is uh, latent in matter that wants release. And as it wants release, it calls, there is some kind of a call that occurs. And life is what responded to that call because life is the next higher form of consciousness. It responded to that call and came down thinking that it will manifest a world of life. But as he points out over here, that also necessitates the taking on of an alien power or alien form of consciousness. And they don't match each other. And so there is some discomfort. There's, there's uh, distortion on both sides that takes place and what results is a evolution something new that happens but something that diminishes whatever there was and brings to life new properties that were not there See? so this kind of process is occurring whether at the level of a kind of cosmic layer of consciousness or at the level of cosmic uh, uh, conscious beings. See. And what Ashwapati is doing is a continuation of the same process with which this is partly the reason Sri Aurobindo begins his text synthesis of yoga with the line, all life is yoga. This is the yoga of life. This is the yoga that is going on well before it individualizes itself in the individual. So Sri Aurobindo, I mean, the, here we find that Ashwapati keeps discovering these, uh, uh, keeps, um, uh, you know, uh, going through these worlds and uh, tries to understand how these worlds operate, essentially. And that's what gives us the cosmology of the life planes. that you can read for yourself. And you have the kingdoms. Uh, I think Matteo asked the question of the difference between the kingdoms and the godheads. And <clears throat> essentially, this is the difference between consciousness and person. See? A kingdom is a world. And so it's a kind of a background consciousness, but consciousness is also embodied by beings. So that entire consciousness is actually ultimately one being. So that would be called the being of that, like the being of mind. You could also call it the cosmic being. But that cosmic being has different aspects that uh, oversee or take care of different types of uh, forces in that setup, in that infrastructure. And those would be the godheads of that world. One of the really, we, we saw that happening. One of the uh, important aspects of this whole idea of evolution is the emergence of the person. So consciousness can emerge, just as we saw over here, 
matter is calling life to descend, life is emerging in matter, it's a form of consciousness. But with the emergence of consciousness, conditions are being created for more and more personhood to be manifest in the creatures or entities of that consciousness. So, this what is the nature of self-consciousness as a person? To what extent does personhood uh, become a manifestation of that being of consciousness? You see, the being of consciousness knows itself in every creature. You see, that is the emergence of the person. And the emergence of the person takes place over time and it is only in the human that the person becomes fully self-conscious as person. And this is a very interesting point in the evolution because it appears along with the emergence of mind into a certain level or scale of its own operation, the intelligent scale of its operation which has reflexivity. That is why we will find that in for example, in Sankhya, uh, Buddhi precedes uh, Ahankara. You see, the ego actually emerges right at that point when Buddhi is about to uh, you know start manifesting and Buddhi exceeds Ahankara because uh, intellect has got a part to it which connects with cosmic intuition that is impersonal. So, there is a certain impersonal aspect that ultimately the entire effort of science is to purify the mind to a point where it can become impersonal. So, this personality which emerges with the mind becoming intelligent is also a curse to a certain extent, it binds us in our sense of self, but it emerges full blown in the human and it also makes possible the emergence of a certain evolution of the soul, that is what we call the psychic being. Psychic being is an evolved state of the soul that only arrives when self consciousness enters into prakriti as the intellect. So, these are the two evolutions that are going on, one is the evolution of prakriti, the other is the evolution of purusha. The soul is the evolving purusha, the properties of consciousness are evolving prakriti, the worlds belong to prakriti, those are the prakritic conditions and the godheads are the purushas. The lokas would be the worlds. So, and then he uh, goes through the kingdoms and godheads of greater life and at the end of that, end of canto 6, he encounters the descent of night, descent into night. A mind absorbed from life made calm to know a heart divorced from the blindness and the pang, the seal of tears, the bond of ignorance, he turned to find that wide world failures cause. So, this is he hits a kind of a ceiling with the life planes and sees that there is something stopping the further advance and what is this? This is he is trying to find why it is that the world is in the condition where it is and not able to receive the higher consciousness. Away he looked from nature's visible face and sent his gaze into the viewless vast, the formidable unknown infinity asleep behind the endless coil of things that carries the universe in its timeless breaths and the ripples of its being are our lives. The worlds are built by its unconscious breath and matter and mind are its figures or its powers. So, this is the entire prakriti that he is coming into contact with. 
Our waking thoughts the output of its dreams. The veil was rent that covers nature's depths. He saw the fount of the world's lasting pain and the mouth of the black pit of ignorance. The evil guarded at the roots of life raised up its head and looked into his eyes. On a dim bank where dies subjective space, from a stark ridge overlooking all that is, a tenebrous awakened nescience, her wide blank eyes wandering at time and form, stared at the inventions of the living void and the abyss whence our beginnings rose. Behind appeared a grey carved mask of night, watching the birth of all created things. A hidden puissance, conscious of its force, a vague and lurking presence everywhere, a contrary doom that threatens all things made, a death figuring as the dark seed of life, seemed to engender and to slay the world. So he encounters, we are first introduced to the opposition here. That will be the very theme of Savitri. That Savitri will be called upon to combat death and the power of negation, see, the power of falsehood at the base of life. See. So he comes across this power and sees that it is due to this power that it is not possible to go further for mankind unless there is an intervention. It's again very interesting that this again is a type of a trope or episode that will be encountered in the lives of a number of major world figures. For example, the Buddha. So the Buddha will encounter death in his meditation under the Bodhi tree. And the, the, one of the really interesting things about the Buddha is if you really study the texts connect, connected with the Buddha, they do not go here. Because you will find that the descriptions, firstly the description, the art which is, which precedes the earliest texts by the way the Theravada texts and the early stories told mythically of the Buddha's life which are already present in the art do not match up. Uh, in the story of his uh, encounter with Mara with death, uh, there are three uh, stages. And the third stage is when there is the complete attack by Mara and when he cannot, when he does not reply, uh, Mara says, how dare you not respond to me? What makes you think that you are greater than me or is there any power on in the cosmos that can bear witness to your greatness? that you existed before me. I am the pri primary, the prior. This kind of argument will be again brought up by death in Savitri. It says that I am the first, out of me everything began and I am the last, e into me everything will return. And I have witnesses to prove it and all his hordes raise their hands and say yes, yes. yes. And he says do you have any witness? to prove that this is untrue, that you were before me. And he touches the earth and the earth trembles. You see. So who knew that consciousness existed before death? The earth knew. See. And this is the telos of the earth to express its divinity. You see, This is the real meaning of the Buddha's dialogue with Mara. Not that I will escape from the earth, but that I will immortalize, immortalize the earth. This is the, the real message of this particular little episode. So a similar thing happens over here 
he encounters death for the first time and sees that death is the power that stands in the way of our normal ability to expand into these higher states. Is it just a question of, you know, learning the right uh, meditations or learning the right asanas, you know, and we'll experience the supermind. And it doesn't happen like that because there's ontological difficulties and that's what he encounters. And it's a very powerful uh, canto, so I would, uh, uh, you know, encourage you to read it for yourself because we can't. go through everything. And so, he uh, passes through that world and he actually overcomes that world in himself and he enters the paradise of the life worlds, the higher life worlds, the higher life worlds which are not touched by death, the pure life worlds that would manifest if this distortion did not occur. And then from there he enters into the worlds of mind and the kingdoms and godheads of the little mind are more uh, close to what we experience, uh, which are the worlds of, uh, you know, the, what he calls the mortal mind. And then he moves from there to the kingdoms and godheads of the greater mind. And these kingdoms of goddess of the greater mind will open up to these cosmic mind planes. You see the cosmic mind planes that he, Sri Aurobindo talks about as the unfinished evolution of the human. That we've reached a certain point of the manifestation of mind, but there are cosmic mind planes that we have to receive and build the stations so that we can manifest our exp experience and, uh, you know, act from those heights. So, I read from there, this is Canto 11. A breath of unattained divinity visits the imperfect earth on which we toil. Page 261. Across a gleaming ether's golden laugh, a light falls on our vexed, unsatisfied lives. A thought comes down from the ideal worlds and moves us to new model even here, some image of their greatness and appeal and wonder beyond the ken of mortal hope. Amid the heavy sameness of the days and contradicted by the human law of faith in things that are not and must be, lives, comrade to this world's delight and pain the child of the secret soul's forbidden desire, born of its amour with eternity. So, so, we have to aspire for what is impossible, what is not yet manifest, because that is part of our existence, for raison d'etre, the reason for existence. A memory steals from a lost heaven of truth, a wide release comes near, a glory calls, a might looks out, an estranged felicity. But our dwarf, dwarf will and cold pragmatic sense admit not the celestial visitants. Awaiting us, uh, awaiting us on the ideal speaks, or guarded in our secret self unseen, yet flashed sometimes across the awakened soul, hide from us. Uh, our lives, their greatness, beauty, power. Our present feels sometimes their regal touch. Our future strives towards their luminous thrones. Out of spiritual secrecy they gaze. Immortal footfalls in mind's corridors sound. Our souls can climb into the shining plains. The breaths from which they came can be our home. His privilege regained of shadowless sight the thinker entered the immortal's air and drank again his pure and mighty source. 
immutable in rhythmic calm and joy, he saw sovereignly free in limitless light, the unfallen plains, the thought created worlds, when knowledge is the leader of the act, and matter is of thinking substance made, feeling a heaven bird poised on dreaming wings, answers truth's call as to a parent's voice, form luminous leaps from the all shaping beam, and will a conscious chariot of the gods, and life a splendor stream of musing force, carries the voices of the mystic sons. So then he encounters these three worlds of mind, you know, the, the material mind, the vital mind, and the pure mind. Um, and that leads him out, out of her hushed eternal spaces leaned the great and boundless goddess fain to yield the sunlit sweetness of her secrecies. So, he uh, moves out and then he starts experiencing or exploring the various regions of the overmind. That is what we were talking about earlier, that Sri Aurobindo actually points to various strata of the overmind. One is the heaven of the ideal and as we spoke last time that there, there are two major ideals that are attracting us. They are like attractors of the human march or aspiration. One is will, you know, the will, what Nietzsche called the will to power, the will to self-exceeding. We are constantly driven to exceed wherever we are. That is the will to power that is symbolized by the fire. And then the will to beauty which is the rose. These are the two attractors in the heavens of the ideal. And from there he moves to the self of mind and this is the one of the summits of the over mind because there the vidya and avidya are separated and they are separated by this power of a cosmic doubt. See? And that is the reason why all that are even seen as symbols here are ultimately unsure. We can never be sure of whether the divine is really behind them or whether they are just a you know, semblance, a chimera, something made up by the mind. And so that is what he encounters high up here. After all these experiences, he hits this. So, first he has a great peace over here. So, he is saying, desire came not, nor any gust of will that perturbed, that the great perturber, perturbed enquirer lost his task. Nothing was asked nor wanted any more. There he could stay, the self, the silence one. His soul had peace, it knew the cosmic whole. Page 284. Then suddenly a luminous finger fell on all things seen or touched or heard or felt and showed his mind that nothing could be known. That must be reached from what from which all knowledge comes, that is beyond the realm of the mind, you see, or not just the human mind, this is the over mind. That must be reached from which all knowledge comes. The skeptic ray disrupted all that seems and smote at the very roots of thought and sense. In a universe of nescience they have grown, aspiring towards a superconscient sun, playing in shine and rain from heavenlier skies. They never can win however high their reach or overpass however keen their probe. A doubt corroded even the means to think. Distrust was thrown upon mind's instruments. All that it takes for reality's shining coin, proved fact, fixed inference, deduction clear, firm theory, assured significance, appeared as frauds upon time's credit bank. 
or assets valueless in truth's treasury, and ignorance on an uneasy throne, travestied with a fortuitous sov sovereignty, a figure of knowledge garbed in dubious words, and tinsel thought forms brightly inadequate. So he completely loses all that he has thought that he has achieved, all his knowledge. And then he, so he's lost sense of meaning and this is another one of the dark nights. There's these dark nights that repeat in the lives of both Satyavan and Savitri. This is one of the dark nights. And then he is plunged into another dimension. This is the dimension of the world soul, the psychic world. Right? This is not his individual psychic, but the entire cosmic psychic. That is Canto 14, the world soul. And here we encounter the two again. So here the psychic being is a first, our first connection with integrality. Because the two that are sundered in the cosmos are one over there. The psychic being is already a marriage of Purusha and Prakriti. And so in the psychic world, that's what he sees and meaning returns to him. So this is the, towards the end, page 294. Here was the fashioning chamber of the worlds. An interval was left twixt act and act, twixt birth and birth, twixt dream and waking dream a pause that gave new strength to do and be. Beyond were regions of delight and peace, mute birthplaces of light and hope and love, and cradles of heavenly rapture and repose. In a slumber of the voices of the world, he of the eternal moment grew aware. His knowledge stripped bare of the garbs of sense, knew by identity without thought or word, his being saw itself without its veils, life's line fell from the spirit's infinity. Along a road of pure interior sight, alone between tremendous presences, under the watching eyes of nameless gods, his soul passed on a single conscious power towards the end which ever begins again approaching through a stillness dumb and calm to the source of all things human and divine. There he beheld in their mighty union's poise the figure of the deathless two in one. A single body in two bodies, a single being in two bodies clasped, a diarchy of two united souls seated absorbed in deep creative joy. Their trance of bliss sustained the mobile world. Behind them in a morning dusk one stood who brought them forth from the unknowable. Ever disguised she awaits the seeking spirit, watcher on the supreme unreachable peaks, guide of the traveller of the unseen paths, she guards the austere approach to the alone. At the beginning of each far spread plain, Pervading with her power the cosmic suns, she reigns, inspirer of its multiple works and thinker of the symbol of its scene. Above them all she stands, supporting all, the sole omnipotent goddess ever veiled, of whom the world is the inscrutable mask. The ages are the footfalls of her tread, their happenings the figure of her thoughts, and all creation is her endless act. His spirit was made a vessel of her force. Mute in the fathomless passion of, her, of his will, he outstretched to her his folded hands of prayer. Then in a sovereign answer to his heart, a gesture came as of worlds thrown away, and from her raiment's lustrous mystery raised, one arm half parted the eternal veil. A light appeared still and imperishable. Attracted to the large and luminous depths, 
of the ravishing enigma of her eyes, he saw the mystic outline of her face. Overwhelmed by her implacable light and bliss, an atom of her illimitable self, mastered by the honey and lightning of her power, tossed towards the shores of her ocean ecstasy, drunk with a deep golden spiritual wine, he cast from the still rent stillness of his soul a cry of adoration and desire and the surrender of his boundless mind and the self-giving of his silent heart. He fell down at her feet, unconscious, groan. So this is again another Shushupti. <laughs> you know, it's interesting the secret knowledge, it's the two in one, but the one from whom the two in one is spoken of in masculine terms. And here the one is spoken of as the goddess. And uh, he, it's just too much for him. <laughs> <laughs> he completely is blown away, he enters into deep Shushupti. So that, that is the beginning, beginning of the end of Ashwapati's, you know, chapter, so to say, book, because this is going to lead him to cross over to the kingdoms of gold, greater knowledge, which is really the Vidya planes, the planes of b beginning with supermind. And as he enters there, he is actually going to start losing it. He's going to lose whatever he came there for. for. And we'll enter into the book of the Divine Mother. So which is uh, book three. Canto 1, The Pursuit of the Unknowable, and then Canto 2, The Adoration of the Divine Mother. So he enters into this zone, and here he is about to lose it all. And so that is how the Canto 2 begins. A stillness absolute, incommunicable, meets the sheer self-discovery of the soul. A wall of stillness shuts it from the world. A gulf of stillness swallows up the sense and makes unreal all that mind has known and all that the laboring senses still would weave, prolonging an imaged unreality. So this connects in a way to the self of mind in that sense that everything that has been experienced is being wiped out. Self's vast spiritual silence occupies space. Only the inconceivable is left, only the nameless without space and time. Abolished is the burdened need, burdening need of life. Thought falls from us, we cease from joy and grief. The ego is dead. We are free from being and care. We have done with birth and death and work and fate. And then there is a sudden turn, right? O oh soul, it is too early to rejoice. Thou hast reached the boundless silence of the self. Thou hast leaped into a glad divine abyss. But where hast thou thrown self's mission and self's power? On what dead bank on the eternal's road? One was within thee who was self and world. What hast thou done for his purpose in the stars? Escapes br escape brings not the victory and the crown. Something thou camest to do from the unknown, but nothing is finished and the world goes on because only half God's cosmic work is done. Only the everlasting no has neared and stared into thy eyes and killed thy heart. But where is the lover's everlasting yes, and immortality in the secret heart, the voice that chants to the creator fire, the symboled om, the great assenting word, 
the bridge between the rapture and the calm, the passion and the beauty of the bride, the chamber where the glorious enemies kiss, the smile that saves the golden peak of things. A black veil has been lifted. We have seen the mighty shadow of the omniscient Lord. But who has lifted up the veil of light and who has seen the body of the king? The mystery of God's birth and acts remain, leaving unbroken the last chapter's seal. Unsolved the riddle of the unfinished play. The cosmic player laughs within his mask and still the last inviolate secret hides behind the human glory of a form, behind the gold idolon of a name. A large white line has figured as a goal, but far beyond the ineffable sun tracks blaze. So in this condition, even while he stood on being's naked edge, and all the passion and seeking of his soul faced their extinction in some featureless vast, the presence he yearned for suddenly grew close, drew close. Across the silence of the ultimate calm, out of a marvelous transcendence's core, a body of wonder and translucency, as if a sweet mystic summary of herself escaping into the original bliss, had come enlarged out of eternity, someone came infinite and absolute. A being of wisdom, power and delight, even as a mother draws her child to her arms, took to her breast nature and world and soul. Abolishing the signless emptiness, breaking the vacancy and voiceless hush, piercing the limitless unknowable, into the liberty of the motionless depths, a beautiful and felicitous luster stole. And this is uh, the Divine Mother who comes to him just when he's about to forget everything. And uh, at this point I will draw on Matteo to uh, give us the description of the Divine Mother. Over here. Inspired by Sri Aurobindo's comment in the future poetry, I started exploring ways to get the mantra to penetrate deeper. So for me, this has been an experiment that I'd like to share. And I think it helps to, to really go inside and have the mantra work from the inside. So I'll start with a bell. in some featureless vast. The presence he yearned for 
suddenly drew close across the silence of the ultimate calm out of a marvelous transcendence core a body of wonder and translucency as if a sweet mystic summary of herself escaping into the original bliss had come enlarged out of eternity someone came infinite and absolute a being of wisdom power and delight even as a mother draws her child to her arms, took to her breast, nature and world and soul. Abolishing the signless emptiness, breaking the vacancy and voiceless hug, you're seeing the limitless unknowable into the liberty of the motionless depths of beautiful and felicitous luster stole the power the light the bliss no word can speak imaged itself in a surprising beam and built a golden passage to his heart touching through him all longing sentient things a moment's sweetness of the all-beautiful Cancelled the vanity of the cosmic world. A nature throbbing with the heart divine was felt in the unconscious universe. It made the breath a happy mystery. A love that bore the cross of pain with joy you demonized the sorrow of the world made happy the weight of long unending time the secret caught of god's felicity affirming in life a hidden ecstasy it held the spirit to its miraculous course carrying immortal values to the hours it justified the labor of the sun for one was there supreme behind the god a mother might brooded upon the world a consciousness revealed its marvelous front transcending all that is denying none imperishable above our fallen heads he felt a rapturous and unstumbling force the undying truth appeared the enduring power of all that here is made and then destroyed the mother of all godheads and all strengths who mediatrix binds earth to the supreme the enigma ceased that rules our nature's night 
The covering nescience was unmasked and slain. Its mind of air was stripped off from things, and the dull moods of its perverting will illumined by her all-seeing identity knowledge and ignorance could strive no more no longer could the titan opposites antagonist poles of the world's artifice impose the illusion of their twofold screen throwing their figures between us and her a wisdom was near disguised by its own works of which the darkened universe is the road no more existence seemed an aimless fall extinction was no more the soul relief a hidden word was found the long sought clue Revealed was the meaning of our spirit's birth. Condemned to an imperfect body and mind in the inconscience of material things and the indignity of mortal life. A heart was felt in the spaces wide and bare. A burning love from white spiritual founts annulled the sorrow of the ignorant depths suffering was lost in her immortal smile a life from beyond grew conqueror here of death to err no more was natural to mine wrong could not come where all was light and love the formless and the formed were joined in her. Immensity was exceeded by a look. A face revealed the crowded infinite. Incarnating inexpressibly in her limbs, the boundless joy the blind world forces seek. Her body of beauty mooned the seas of bliss. At the head she stands of birth and toil and fate. In their slow round the cycles turn to her call. Alone her hands can change time's dragon bay. Hers is the mystery the night conceals. The spirit's alchemist energy is hers. She is the golden bridge, the wonderful fire, the luminous heart of the unknown is she. A power of silence in the depths of God. She is the force, the inevitable word, the magnet of our difficult ascent, the sun from which we kindle all our suns, the light that leans from the unrealized vasts, the joy that beckons from the impossible the might of all that never yet came down. The luminous heart of the unknown is she, a power of silence in the depths of God. She is the force, the inevitable word, the magnet of our difficult ascent, the sun from which we kindle all our suns. The light that leans from the unrealized vasts, the joy that beckons from the impossible, the might of all that never yet came down. She is the golden bridge, 
the wonderful fire. She is the golden bridge, the wonderful fire. She is the golden bridge, the wonderful fire. So, Ashwapati has this darshan and then he enters into a state of consciousness that brings him new experiences and this is really the experience of the super mind that he has. Um, so, I will read a little bit more and then uh, we will enter into the end of this Ashwapati's yoga where he gets the assurance of the incarnation of Savitri. But uh, I think we will do that after we come back from, from the break. So, uh, here after this darshan, uh, towards the end of that uh, canto. Thus was a seed cast into, well I actually going a little further from what Matteo read. All nature dumbly calls to her alone to heal with her feet the aching throb of life and break the seals on the dim soul of man and kindle her fire in the closed heart of things. All here shall be one day her sweetness's home, all contraries prepare her harmony. Towards her our knowledge climbs, our passion gropes. In her miraculous rapture we shall dwell, her clasp will turn to ecstasy our pain. Our self shall be one self with all through her. In her confirmed, because transformed in her, our life shall find in its fulfilled response above the boundless hushed beatitudes, below the wonder of the embrace divine. This known as in a thunder flash of God, the rapture of things eternal filled his limbs. Amazement fell upon his ravished sense. His spirit was caught in her intolerant flame. Once seen, his heart acknowledged only her. Only a hunger of infinite bliss was left. All aims were in her were lost, then found in her. His base was gathered into one, one pointing spire. Thus was a seed cast into endless time. A word is spoken or a light is shown, a moment sees, the ages toil to express. So flashing out of the timeless leap the words, an eternal instant is the cause of the years. All he had done was to prepare a field, his small beginnings asked for a mighty end, for all that he had been must now new shape in him her joy to embody, to enshrine her beauty and greatness in his house of life. This life comes not, this light comes not by struggle or by thought. In the mind silence the transcendent acts and the hushed heart hears the unuttered word. A vast surrender was his only strength. A power that lives upon the heights must act, bring into life's closed room the immortal's air and fill the finite with the infinite. All that denies must be torn out and slain and crushed the many longings for whose sake we lose the one for whom our lives were made. Now other claims had hushed in them his cry, their, in him their cry. Only he longed to draw her presence and power into his heart and mind and breathing frame. 
only he yearned to call forever down her healing touch of love and truth and joy into the darkness of the suffering world. His soul was freed and given to her alone. And this is going to bring him into the last great experience at the threshold of uh, the supermind. A last and mighty and mightiest transformation came. His soul was all in front like a great sea, flooding the mind and body with its waves. His being spread to embrace the universe, united the within and the without to make of life a cosmic harmony, an empire of the imminent divine. In this tremendous universality, not only his soul nature and mind sense included every soul and mind in his, but even the life of flesh and nerve was changed and grew one flesh and nerve with all that is. He felt the joy of others as his joy. He bore the grief of others as his grief. His universal sympathy upbore immense like ocean, the creation's load, as earth upbears all beings sacrifice, thrilled with the hidden transcendence, joy and peace. There was no more division's endless scroll. One grew the spirit's secret unity. All nature felt again the single bliss. There was no cleavage between soul and soul. There was no barrier between world and God. Overpowered were form and memory's limiting line. The covering mind was seized and torn apart. It was dissolved and now no more could be. The one consciousness that made the world was seen. He stood fulfilled on the world's highest line, awaiting the ascent beyond the world, awaiting the descent, the world to save. A splendor and a symbol wrapped the earth. Serene epiphanies looked and hallowed vasts surrounded. Wide infinitudes were close and bright remotenesses leaned near and kin. Sense failed in that tremendous lucency. Ephemeral voices from his hearing fell and thought potent no more sank large and pale like a tired god into mysterious seas. So from this kind of condition, he has the experience of the supermind. And that is described on page 322. Then suddenly there came a downward look, as if a sea exploring its own depths. A living wideness, a living oneness widened at its core and joined him to unnumbered multitudes. A bliss, a light, a power, a flame white love caught all into a soul immense embrace. Existence found its truth on oneness's breast and each became the self and space of all. The great world rhythms were heartbeats of one soul. To feel was a flame discovery of God. All mind was a single harp of many strings. All life a song of many meeting lives. For worlds were many, but the self was one. This knowledge was now made a cosmos's seed. This seed was cased in the safety of the light. It needed not the sh a sheath of ignorance. Then from the trance of that tremendous clasp and from the throbbings of that single heart and from the naked spirit's victory, a new and marvelous creation rose. So he sees the possibility of a new manifestation, a supramental manifestation that arises in him from this experience. In these new worlds projected, he became a portion of the universal gaze, a station of the all-inhabiting light, a ripple on a single sea of peace. 
His mind answered to countless communing minds. His words were syllables of the cosmos's speech. His life a field of the vast cosmic stir. He felt the footsteps of a million wills moving in unison to a single goal. A stream ever newborn that never dies, caught in its thousandfold current's ravishing flow, with its eddies of immortal sweetness thrilled, he bore, coiling through his members as they passed, calm movements of interminable delight, the bliss of a myriad myriads who are one. So he finds this, uh, this, these words, the perfect words, the words of perfection. But from here he sees also the other words and our words. He sees them as, sh as shadows of these words. So in page 329, uh, All that now passes lived immortal there, in the proud beauty and fine harmony of matter plastic to spiritual light. Its ordered hours proclaimed the eternal law, vision reposed on a safety of deathless forms, time was eternity's transparent robe, an architect hewing out self's living rock, phenomenon built reality's summer house, on the beaches of the sea of infinity. Against this glory of spiritual states, their parallels and yet their opposites floated and swayed, eclipsed and shadow-like, as if a doubt made substance flickering pale. This other scheme two vast negations found, a world that knows not its inhabiting self, labors to find its cause and need to be. A spirit ignorant of the world it made, obscured by matter, travestied by life, struggles to emerge, to be free, to know and reign. These were close tied in one disharmony. Yet the divergent lines met not at all. Three powers governed its irrational course. In the beginning an unknowing force, in the middle an embodied striving soul, in the end, a spirit, a silent spirit denying life. A dull, infelicitous interlude unrolls its dubious truth to a questioning mind, compelled by the ignorant power to play its part and to record her inconclusive tale, the mystery of her inconscient plan and the riddle of a being born from night by a marriage of necessity and chance. This darkness hides our nobler destiny. A chrysalis of a great and glorious truth, it stifles the winged marvel and in its sheath, lest from the prison of matter it escape, and wasting its beauty on the formless vast, merged into the unknowable's mystery, leave unfulfilled the world's miraculous fate. As yet thought only some high spirit's dream, or a vexed illusion in man's toiling mind, a new creation from the old shall rise, a knowledge inarticulate find speech, beauty suppressed burst into paradise bloom, pleasure and pain dive into absolute bliss. A tongueless oracle shall speak at last, the superconscient conscious grow on earth, the eternal's wonders join the dance of time. Just join the dance of time. So this is, you see, the the Sri Aurobindo. Every now and then in Savitri, we find these sine waves, as you said, but he'll take on a prophetic voice. He'll prophesy. He'll talk about what is to come, and this is one of those great passages like that. But now all seemed a vainly teeming vast, 
upheld by a deluded energy to a spectator self-absorbed and mute, careless of the unmeaning show he watched regarding the bizarre procession pass like one who waits for an expected end. He saw a word that is from a world to be. That this is where he'll tell you that this is, he's looking at our worlds now. He's looking at our world from the world to be, the future world. And he, so the, the lines will take you back to his situation. He's sitting in meditation and he, all this is happening and he sees this world and comes back, you see. Uh, he saw a world that is from a world to be. There he divined rather than felt or saw or felt far off upon the rim of consciousness. He, he, he's sensing far off upon the rim of consciousness, transient and frail, this little whirling globe, and on it left like a lost dream's faint vain mold, a fragile copy of the spirit's shell. His body gathered into mystic sleep, a foreign shape it seemed, a mythic shade. He senses his body there, meditating. Alien now seemed that dim far universe, self and eternity alone were true. Then memory climbed to him from the striving plains, bringing a cry from once loved cherished things, and to the cry as to its own lost call, a ray replied from the occult supreme. For even there the boundless oneness dwells. So he comes back as it were, there was a dim response, a distant breath. All had not ceased in the unbounded hush. His heart lay somewhere conscious and alone, far down below him like a lamp in night. Abandoned it lay, alone, imperishable, immobile, with excess of passionate will. It persevered through life's huge emptiness amid the blank denials of the world. It sent its voiceless prayer to the unknown. It listened for the footsteps of its hopes. Returning through the void immensities, it waited for the fiat of the word that comes through the still self from the Supreme. So this will lead him to his ultimate confrontation with the Divine Mother. She's going to return. And so this is why we see towards the end, there are these repeated comings and goings. He keeps encountering a consciousness that is too much for him. He falls unconscious. He returns. He moves a little further. He encounters that consciousness in another form. And these quick successions take place till we come to the last cantos where he confronts the Divine Mother and he asks for her intervention. So I think before that happens, we can have some tea and come back. <laughs>